everyone. My name is Roseanne Tolan, and I'm the author of More Than Marmalade, Michael Bond, and the Story of Paddington Bear, which is the first ever biography written about Michael Bond, the creator of the Paddington Bear series. And I'm sure that either you have read the books or you have watched the two Paddington Bear movies, which there's a third one coming out, I believe this year, or perhaps you have seen the television shows, but I think that readers everywhere will be surprised to find out what the real life inspirations for Paddington really were. So this book is about Michael Bond, the writer's life, and also reveals those true life inspirations, which are a bit of a surprise. So I'm going to read an excerpt from the first chapter of Michael Bond and the story of Paddington Bear. So here goes. Chapter one, trains, books, and bears. Things are always happening to me. I'm that sort of bear. Michael Bond in A Bear Called Paddington. Thomas Michael Bond pushed his way through the crowd of people standing on the railway platform. He was 10 years old, and although he stood on his toes, the tall adults waiting to board the Cornish Riviera Express train blocked his view. He needed to get closer before it disappeared down the tracks. The steam-powered engine charged toward the platform, spouting clouds of thick smoke into the sky. Its engine, fueled by burning coal, tugged at least 13 passenger cars. They rattled into the station, hissing like a snake. Pardon me, sir, Michael called. Pardon me, ma'am. At last, he popped out at the front edge of the crowd. Just then, the train puffed and wheezed to a stop. What a sight. It was 1936, and the locomotive was one of the largest trains operating on the Great Western Railway mesmerized by its enormous size. Michael barely noticed all the people clamoring to climb aboard. Once the passengers disappeared inside the steel carriages, only Michael was left on the platform. With a sputter and a low chuffing sound, the train started back down the, the track. Bursts of white steam sprayed from the chimney stack. The piercing whistle made Michael cover his large ears, which looked like they'd been molded from clay. Although the noise was painful to hear, every sound the train made enchanted him. The rods that drove the wheels clunked back and forth. The cars rattled and clanked. A narrow funnel poured fine gravel on the tracks to help the wheels grip the rails. If Michael listened closely, he could hear the heavy locomotive crunching the sand. Are you lost, lad? A man in a blue conductor's uniform startled him. No, sir, said Michael, snapping out of his gaze. In his daydream, he had seen his own name painted on the front of the train. How long had he been standing there? Locomotives continued to captivate Michael his entire life. He would frequently walk to nearby reading station just to get a glimpse of the massive express roaring by. Born in 1926 in Berkshire, England, Michael moved with his family to the bigger city of Reading when he was still a baby. They lived on one side of a duplex home with a large yard all around the house. The name of Michael's town was appropriate since inside his boyhood home, the rooms were packed with books. I was fortunate, Michael said, to be brought up in a house where books were part of the furniture. Both of his parents supported Michael's love of reading. His father, a postal worker, gave him a subscription to a comic book that came out weekly called Magnet. Michael devoured page after page of its detective stories and tales of adventure. Michael's mother read even more than he did. Every week she went to the public library to check out new books. Michael always tagged along. The wide aisles filled with thick hardbacks thrilled him. He slowly wandered through the stacks to see what might catch his eye. At the same time, several well-known series featured beer, bears. Winnie the Pooh had arrived in Britain the year before Michael was born and was still popular. Another favorite still in publication today was Rupert Bear, a comic strip character in the Daily Express newspaper. Once Michael picked out an armful of library books, he met his mother at the checkout counter. He neatly stacked his pile next to the ones she had carefully collected. My, said the librarian, what a great many books you have chosen, young man. You must love to read. Yes, miss, Michael said politely. 
The librarian beamed. I see you've been taught proper manners. Thank you, madam. He bundled his books with a stiff leather strap to make them easier to carry. Then he and his mother set off for home. Sometimes they strolled through a park called Forbury Gardens. When they took that route, they passed the Maywind Lion statue, a war memorial built in 1884. And here's a picture of it. Michael stared in amazement at the imposing bronze structure. Reminders of many battles England fought were all around him. World War I had ended less than 10 years before he was born, and the Royal Berkshire Regiment War Memorial honored those soldiers. Grown-ups still remembered that awful time. Thousands of young lives were lost, leaving grieving families behind. Michael often heard stories of the lean years when things like milk, meat, and butter were in short supply. Back then, even King George and Queen Mary used ration cards issued by the, Brid by the British government. As Michael and his mother walked through town, they waved hello to people they recognized. Now and then, the two of them stopped to chat with friends. Since there was no reason to hurry, they picked up jam tarts at the local bakery. Michael's mother allowed him to savor one as they sauntered along. He let the sweet raspberry filling linger on his tongue. Back at home, Michael set his books on the kitchen table. His stack made a satisfying whoomp as it landed on the checkered cloth. He had a lot of reading to do. As usual, he tried his best to keep up with his mom. Michael always told people that she practically read a book a day. Michael's mother loved reading so much that she took time to thank the authors. Later that day, she tapped Michael on the shoulder. Shall we write a letter? She asked. Who shall we write to today, mommy? Another novelist, said his mother. She retrieved a book she had checked out of the library. The detective story was her favorite from the week before. Determined to find more clues, she had decided to borrow it a second time. Fetch the good paper from your father's desk, she said. Michael sprinted down the hall and pulled a few sheets of crisp white writing paper from the desk drawer. He knew it was expensive, so he was careful not to crease the edges. When he got back to the kitchen, his mother was already seated at the table. The book was open to a passage she had practically memorized. While her index finger followed in a straight line, Michael skimmed the words. They fit together perfectly like the last few pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Then Michael and his mother wrote a letter that went something like this. Dear sir, I have had the distinct pleasure of reading your latest book. The people you write about come alive on the page. Many delightful hours passed when I read the story the first time. I plan to read it again. Yours sincerely, Mrs. Francis M. Bond. Michael admired his mother's perfect penmanship. She used a dip pen, so he gave the ink a minute to dry. Then he carefully folded the letter while his mom wrote the publisher's address on the envelope. Once she sealed it, he took it back down the hallway, past the staircase, and stepped outside. He placed the letter in the small metal box hanging beside the front door. By the time he returned inside, his mother was cooking dinner. Why don't you take Binky into the garden and have a bit of fun, his mother suggested. She wiped her hands on her apron. Oily smudges dotted its cotton smock like splattered paint. Come on, Binky, Michael said. He clapped his hands and the family dog came running. Binky looked a lot like a terrier and was mostly white with black spots on both ears. They hurried into the backyard where there was space to throw a ball. Binky loved to run after the ball and bring it back to Michael. Sometimes Binky would pretend to bring it back only to veer away at the last second. Michael ended up chasing him and laughing the entire time. When they were both out of breath, they went back inside. Binky flopped down on the cool kitchen floor. Michael grabbed his books off the table and headed up to his room. The second he walked in, a chorus of squeals greeted him. Hi, Pip, he called as he closed the door behind him. Hello, Squeak. He approached a cage that held three plump guinea pigs. Hi, Wilfred, he greeted the third ball of fur. Michael turned around to balance the stack of books on his bed. Then carefully, he scooped each guinea pig up out of the cage. He lowered them to the floor where they immediately ran off to investigate his room. One went under the dresser while the other shot over to the wall. The third followed Michael to his bed. When the boy flopped down on his mattress, Wilfred sat up on his hind legs and sniffed the air. Michael loved to let his pet guinea pigs run free. His mother didn't like that much, but she said it was all right as long as they stayed in his room. He picked up a book of animal fables and began reading aloud. Squeak especially was soothed by the sound of Michael's voice. She crawled under the bed and closed her eyes. After reading for an hour, Michael fell asleep with his head on the open book. His mother called up the stairs, waking him from his nap. Come eat your supper, Michael. 
Michael swooped up Wilfred and Pip right away. He reached for Squeak, but she slipped out of his palm and burrowed farther beneath the bed. After a quick game of chase, Michael caught her and gently lowered her into the cage. Sorry, Michael apologized as he closed the barred door. I'll let you out again later. He raced down the steps and into the kitchen. His father was home and took his seat at the table. His mom had made bubble and squeak, patties formed from bacon and roasted vegetables fried and topped with an egg for dinner. The dish was called bubble and squeak because of the funny sounds the patties made as they cooked. After eating their fill, the family discussed all the things they had done that day. When it was Michael's father's turn to talk, tales of the mailroom took over. Once the dishes were cleared and Binky was fed, Michael's mother rotated the radio dial to Duke Ellington's orchestra. She sat down with a book, the sound of jazz music spreading throughout the room like a smooth, snug blanket. Next came the time that Michael liked most. What story would you like to hear? His father asked. A new one, Michael said. I picked it out already. Since Michael was too old for picture books, his father read children's novels to him every night. It was a special way for them to spend time together. They went upstairs and Michael pointed to a book he had set on his nightstand. He dove under the covers while his father sat on the edge of the bed. Opening to the first page, his father began to read. The next day, Michael finished the next five chapters when he got home from school. At bedtime, his father would read to him from the point where Michael had stopped. Every night, his father's voice relaxed him. His home was safe and calm. The smell of his mother's lavender bath salts drifted down the hall into his bedroom. In the corner, Pip, Squeak, and Wilfred rustled around in their cage. Soon they settled in and went to sleep. Michael drifted off, dreaming about the story his father had read to him from the library book. So that wraps up the first chapter of More Than Marmalade. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope that you are able to find this book and finish it and I would love to hear from you and just let me know what you think about it. There's a lot more to it and not all of it is um, easy for Michael Bott. He definitely has to face some hardships on the way to fulfilling his dream as an author. So again, I hope that you enjoyed this and I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks!